So, if you haven't seen it, uh, we have a little pop-up exhibit downstairs uh, to um, mark the centenary of the end of World War I. Um, it's near and dear to me, my granddad was in it, took shrapnel in it. So, uh, but what's special about it is that a lot of the people in this room um, brought things in, so it's a very collaborative effort. So when you first see it, it's fairly, um, you can see it's a very intimate type exhibit. So spend some time with it, it'll kind of grow and grow on you as you start to explore and you might see things about people you know and their ancestry and things like that. Um, it's a wonderful exhibit, it's not up for that long, so um, I think it comes down 19th. So. Um, just uh, we are on a holiday schedule. We are closed thanks to Giving Day, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day. Um, holiday hours are ten to one Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So it'll be on our website, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, in January, right after Christmas, comes Monsters from the Deep, Fact or Fiction, um, which it will be in here where you're sitting, replacing this exhibit. Um, and you know what we're doing is exploring some of the more unusual creatures that you might see in the deep sea and some of the mythological uh, versions of them that have been in movies and books and, and talk, backing into the science that way. So it should be fairly interesting um, and visually quite spectacular. I've always maintained that we should have a, uh, a costume party for the exhibit opening. So. Um, <laughs> If anybody uh, feels like they uh, would like to do more or they've got uh, some time, um, we always need volunteer support for lots and lots of different projects at the museum. We uh, come to a grinding halt without our volunteers. We love our volunteers. We, uh, we love working with our volunteers. And um, come and join our family. Um, and you can go on the website or just come to the museum or call any of those ways you can learn about it. But um, speak to a volunteer tonight if you're not volunteering and they'll tell you. They'll share their experience. Anyway, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Douglas Williams, um, who is a docent at DCM, uh, DCM CIMM, uh, since 2015. Uh, thank you, Doug, for your service. Um, he's a Coast Guard Auxiliary, uh, a worldwide traveler, uh, former Peace Corps, uh, and he has volunteered for a long time with the Channel Islands National Park and has a vast familiarity with Anacapa Island. Um, Anacapa, Anacapa Island and the Channel Islands National Park um, it covers just over a square mile and located about 12 miles uh, from the nearest mainland in Oxnard. Um, it may be small in size, but it's rich in history uh, from the sheep herders and rum runners to the shipwrecks and a lighthouse. And before I say any more about it, I'm going to let uh, Douglas take over. So, Douglas, you're on. All right. Welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. I, I volunteer all those places including here, I just want you to know that I, I don't represent any of those places tonight. <laughs> any, any things that I may say are my own opinions, because there's controversy in that channel, believe it or not. <laughs> if you live around here, you know that. So, from beginning to end, there's some things that people have different opinions on. But So, any opinions that get expressed are just mine. Um, the other thing I was going to tell you, I have Parkinson's, so I may turn to you and say, what was I just talking about? <laughs> I, that, that might happen. It's just possible. You never know. Uh, I hope not, but you never know. Um, but anyway, Anacapa Island, a little chunk of rock, it sits offshore if you've ever been out there. I mean, that's, that's what it is, this tiny little chunk of rock. And I, have, I actually have a background in history. I was going to be an historian, I got several degrees in it and stuff, and then computers came along and I took some computer classes and, you know, that was the end of it. So I, I'm sort of a hobby historian, let's say. So I, I, I enjoy using sound historical methods, but, but getting into a period and, and trying to figure out, you know, what, what was in people's minds and what they were thinking and, and how, uh, how they perceived the world, let's say. Well, Anacapa Island, 
First of all, where did it come from? Let's look at the, these are the Channel Islands. You know all of them? The Southern Channel Islands are? San Clemente belongs to who? Who does San Clemente belong to? Navy. United States Navy. Santa Catalina. Santa Catalina has a, kind of a two-part ownership. The town of Avalon basically belonged to the Wrigley family. Some of it's been sold off, some of it hasn't. And the rest of the island is uh, under the management of the, of the uh, Catalina Island Conservancy. A special group that takes care of the rest of the island. Um, Santa Barbara Island, which is the smallest island in the park. The smallest island in the park. Little bitty dot out there, even smaller than Anna Kappa. If you take just the one island by itself. Um, and Santa Barbara Island, we'll see, has some similarities with Anna Kappa. San Nicolas Island, way out there, which is run by the Navy. It's part of the Pacific Missile Range. And it's associated with Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, that's the Southern Channel Islands. Santa Barbara is sort of, it's a debate, is it part of the southern or part of the northern? It's kind of right in the middle. So the first of the northern Channel Islands, our friend, Anna Kappa, that we see every morning if we live down here. Santa Cruz, which is the big island, associated in size with uh, Santa Catalina. It's actually larger, but not quite as long. Catalina's a little longer, but Santa Cruz tell people it's more massive. Santa Rosa Island, the weather starts deteriorating, and then comes San Miguel. San Miguel sits out in the cold, harsh winds. Well, what happened is, some 60 million years ago, there's actually rock in the channel, down in the bottom of the channel, it's that old. But the real activity in this area started more like 20 to 15 million years ago. And what happened is, way back here, doesn't show on the map, a piece of the, uh, actually of the North American Continental Plate, the real North America. The real North American Continental Plate, by the way, doesn't start until you get around Salt Lake City. If you take a, a stake with a GPS on it and stick it in the ground, and come back in a year, it will move until you get to around Salt Lake City, and it stops moving. That's the actual original beach of the North American continent. Everything else is accretion stuff that's kind of washed in and come up out of the ground and stuck there and scraped off. A lot of our features came because a big, a great big fault called the Farallon Fault came. It was heading north, and the fault that, that we're sitting on, which is called, you remember this, but the, the block that the, the uh, Santa Monica Mountains, the islands, and the channel and all of that sits on a block called the Transverse Bridges Plate. It's a mouthful. It runs roughly from, uh, from uh, up here Point Conception, Point Arguello, along the San Andreas Fault, out to uh, Joshua Tree, which is now a national park, and then Joshua Tree down through San Diego to the, to the ocean. So this big chunk broke, broke off the same time that Baja broke off. It broke off a little further north and a little, a little bit earlier. And it started floating, not floating, well, yes, floating, floating on a sea of magma, really. Just a plate floating on a sea of magma. And the North American continental plate was drifting up in the same direction, but they were a few degrees off, so they slammed together. And what happened was, these, when that happened, well, first of all, look right here. You know what that feature is? The Palos Peninsula. The Palos Peninsula is actually the ninth channel island. 
of the geology. If you've been to Santa Cruz Island and taken the hike and seen those big chalk, chalky, not, not chalk, it's another substance, cliffs. You got the same thing on uh, at, at Palos Verdes. So what happened was this plate is moving up and it slams into the mainland, into the North American continental plate, right up here. And the whole thing starts shifting around. So San Miguel used to be down here. It was the furthest south island. The whole thing rotated up 120 degrees. And while it did that, it stretched the crust real thin in several places. So most of the islands, I'm not a geologist, I'm not, this is just amateur backyard geology. Most of the, the, these islands are uh, composed of marine layer stuff that's washed in from maybe a thousand miles away. It came in on that, per, that fer Ferrolon fault I was talking about and got scraped off. Even a lot of things in the Sierra came to us that way, the big granite boulders and stuff. But uh, what happened here, the crust got stretched real thin right in here. And when the crust got thin, the magma underneath started squeezing up through it. It came up like toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube. We're talking 14, 15 million years ago someplace, and they we're not sure exactly. But it, it's, it's pure lava and brecchia and ash and all volcanic stuff. And Santa Barbara Island and Anacapa Island are both made of that. Anacapa Island came up as a single island, and then wave forces and tectonic forces split it into three islands. So we'll take a look at that. So what's happening now, this is rotated around, and it's eventually probably, well, it, it's headed up north, and this is headed up north, and again, they're a little bit off. So it's causing, that's what causes a lot of our earthquake activity and so on. It also, you can't really see it, you can see a little bit of it here. We have another map, can we go to the slides? I think we have one that shows, well, not too, too good. Let's do, uh, sorry. You can get a little better look at it. You can see what the bottom looks like to some extent. It's actually a lot more convoluted and roiled than that, especially in the channel. And it's because of all of this movement of these plates around, the bottom features are really, really rough. And that's important because what happens is the currents come in and they hit that and they, they cause what's called upwelling. The nutrients in most seas are in the bottom, down on the floor. And if they never get mixed up, there could be a vibrant life down on the ocean floor, but nothing happening in the water column at all. And a lot of the ocean is that way. But here we have this upwelling <clears throat> almost constantly. The San Andes, by the way, will push. They're coming out of the northeast, right? The normal winds are coming out of the northeast, and the San Andes push back the other way, so they're going back east. And they actually slosh the water in the channel so that it, the depth increases here and lessens out here, and then it lets go and sloshes back. So it's like sloshing water in a bathtub on a grand scale. And that brings that stuff up. One thing that likes to eat it a lot is a little, uh, they're kind of cousins of shrimp, they're not really shrimp, called krill. You've probably heard of them if you live here. You may, maybe you've gone out whale watching and you've seen them. Uh, krill, eat the, the other zooplankton that come up from the bottom, mostly vegetative stuff, and they become part of the phytoplankton. And then the largest creature on Earth ever, the blue whale, comes in here and eats them. One big 55 <coughs> gallons, mouthfuls of krill. Stuff smells too. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, this, this shows where we are now. So here's Santa Barbara Island sitting out here. 
It's part of Channel Islands National Park and it's part of Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. But it's not connected to the rest of it. This boundary out here is the National Marine Sanctuary boundary. And in here, just three miles offshore, is the National Park boundary. And in addition, you see these little square things right here? These are marine protected areas. The first marine protected area <coughs> on the west coast, actually, was this one on Catalina Island. So here's, I mean, on Anacapa Island. So my wife said, don't ask people questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer to every question is Anacapa Island. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll also accept Inipak. Inipak is Inipak. the Shumash name cool. for Anacapa Island. Consider this. Why does Inipak have a, a Native American name and all the other islands are named for saints? <laughs> Let's go back to the slides again. I'll show you real quick what it is. Uh, here's a pretty good picture right there. The first visitor that we know of that actually wrote something that we're pretty darn sure is, is the Anacapa Island is Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. We have a little diorama back there, Cabrillo's Landing. Well, his name wasn't really Cabrillo. That was his mother's name. His name was Rodriguez. He came in 1542, and he wrote a log, but it's only about 10 pages long. There's not much in there. Really hard to tell exactly where he went. And he was here quite a while, several months. And on his return trip, he actually died someplace in the islands. There's a big controversy. Well, first there's a controversy about whether he was Spanish or Portuguese, which in the 16th century was a little more hazy than it is now, if you were one or the other. But he worked for the queen, and he actually fought with Cortez in Mexico. He was a very successful soldier, got awarded some acreage in Guatemala, made a success of that, went down and built a big plantation. He was in his 50s, feeling old. <laughs> feeling old in his 50s. Felt like he wanted to do one last fun thing. So he went to the queen, and got what's called a letter of mark, which is basically just sort of a right to go do something for the crown. And he was said, we're going to go up the coast, and we're going to find that passage through the North American continent that we've been looking for. We're probably going to find gold, too. But it was actually him and a bunch of his buddies. They took about 20, 15 or 20 servants each. They had served, it was a different life and a different lifestyle, a different way of seeing things. They took servants for, well, everything they needed. At the same time, they were pious. They saw, they brought a priest along and they said mass. And it was a different world. They got here, and we think they probably didn't come on Anacapa because how are you going to get up here? 200, 250 foot cliffs all the way around. We're going to see in a minute there is an arch. It was a possible route before, but not now. So there was really no practical way without pretty advanced climbing gear, you know. To, although the Native Americans in this, let's see, this, right here in this area, where the you can get this is east out of Capo, or you can get to it from the park. That's middle. I'm sorry. This is east. They, the Native Americans would go out there and uh, on their way out to the islands, taking trips out to the islands, they would stop and fish. They had to bring their own water. There's no water on the island. It's such this porous lava that I've been out there when it rained like two inches and a couple hours later <laughs> the ground was almost dry. It just goes right through it. So it remains a desert no matter how much rain it gets, practically. Um, so there's really no practical way to, to get up there. So he probably didn't. 
And they mentioned something called la vela. La vela in Spanish means the sail. And we were pretty sure they were referring to West Anna Cap Island, which is 900 feet tall. When you're out there on the water, it kind of stands out. And, and if the sun hits it right, it does definitely looks like a ship sail. But we're not sure, of course. We're not sure. 1542. The next reference we really have. Uh, could you take the back of the slides? Mm, right here. First of all, show me that one. Yeah. <laughs> this picture is an American icon, right? This is kind of like, I mean, it's been compared to the Mona Lisa of, of, North, of, North, of Europe or, or our culture. Everybody knows Quistler's mother. Can anybody tell me anything else he painted? He was actually a famous painter and did pretty well for himself. You could because you're probably an art major. Those charts. charts. <laughs> so, yes, he did do the charts. So he was in college. I think at, I think he was at Harvard. And he got in a fight with some of his professors. He sort of had a reputation for being touchy let's say. And he got in a lot of fights over his lifetime. I just read a biography of him a few months ago. Not a biography, just a Wikipedia thing. Interesting character. Let's go back to the slides and now let's see Whistler's Anna Kappa. So a friend of his father's got him a job with the uh, what became the Coastal Geodetic Survey. I think it had a different name at the time. And he drew this for them. Notice a couple things. First of all, this is the... Oop. You don't want that? No, not yet. This is the arch, and we call it Cabrillo's Arch. The Native Americans, the Shumash, called it the House of the Pelican. He drew this, not a bad artist, just a little assignment that he got, but look at this. Can you see those? Here's some more. Now, if you've hung around this museum much, you know that in early maritime paintings, this is how they painted seabirds, often in a circle, flying around in a circle, but always in a group like this. He handed in his work. A week or two later, somebody reviewed it and said, what are these birds doing in this picture? They called him in, summarily fired him. Well, he probably added to it. <laughs> he probably expressed his opinion of the, their, <laughs> their action. And anyway, after some time went by, less than a year, a few months, the, the father and the uh, friend that worked for the Coastal Geodetic Survey went to the boss there, and they worked something out, and he got his job back. They sell a replica of this in the, uh, over in the Park Service, uh, Headquarters. Does everybody know where it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not in the capital. <laughs> the one thing it's not, not the answer to. Okay. So that was, that's 1854. That's sort of our next Anna in the news. Pretty amazing. Back to the slides. What else can we see? Well, we talked about the birds. Um, Anna Kappa is unique. Let's see my fox. This guy is an island fox. On most of the islands, he's at the top of the food chain.
There are no foxes on Anacapa. Or what island has no water and therefore has no foxes? Yeah. <laughs> and that's important because what would happen, you think? First of all, we're going to I'm going to have a big deal on, the, on gulls if you're interested. I, I love gulls. We'll talk about it after class. I don't want to get started on, on gulls. But this is the, the largest breeding colony of what we're called western gulls, which is actually the most common beach gull between Oregon and Mexico. This is the largest breeding colony. There's another breeding colony on Farallon Island and a smaller one on Santa Barbara Island. And there's isolated nests here and there. But Anacapa has sometimes as many as 20,000 birds. You can count the chicks and the parents and everything else. It's disgusting. And it's all because this guy isn't there. They lay, they lay their eggs on the ground. They dig out a little shallow nest and they put their eggs right on the ground. They're camouflage. These guys are pretty smart. <laughs> camouflage isn't going to work. Yeah. So they, they would do one generation, right? And that would be the end of the birds. So it's important that we have these waterless places where seabirds can, can nest. There was a, a problem when the Park Service first took over Anacapa, it was uh, the first, in fact, the, the National Park started off with just that island. Anacapa. <laughs> and added the other islands later. Um, first of all, take me back to the pictures again. Couple things to consider. First of all, how did they get up there? Well, we can see it on this picture right here. This is how they get people onto the island now. There's a dock. Go to the dock. There's some stairs up to a platform. These people are lined up about the, they're boarding. They're getting on the boat. The boat backs up to the dock, and they come down these 156, I've done it lots of times, <laughs> lots of times to count it, and by gosh, I'm going to do it again, 156 steps up to the top. This is called the, the stage here, and what they did is, take me back to the slides again, we'll get a picture that shows... Hopefully, the lighthouse. I just barely see it in this picture. Right here. That's the lighthouse. Now, I used to volunteer to go over and lead day hikes, and then after a couple of years of doing that, the Park Service said, would you like to stay over and manage the campground? So I, for several years I did. I, I went about ten times a year. I went over for three or four days. I stayed right in this little building right here. I managed the campground, which is up the hill this way a little ways. This is uh, interesting. People think it's a church. It's two great big water tanks, big river water tanks. During World War II, we had uh, military people out here stationed. This house was, there's about, there were, I think, five of these, four or five of them. Unfortunately, before it became a park, it was sort of there, and people, and the stage was there, so you could get up and get on. It wasn't as good as the one now, just a wooden ladder sort of thing. But fishermen went up there and with some fires that got away from them. And when the Park Service took it over, they had to take down most of the buildings. Those that are left are on the list of historical places, and we, we, needed, we needed new doorknobs one time. And the doorknobs were all green. They were brass doorknobs. Down where the stage was, where I showed you, they do a thing. Um, well, let's, 
I'm getting off track. Let's stick to the lighthouse. There was obvious need for a lighthouse. Um, there are within the, you saw the park boundaries, right? You're up close to the, pretty close, six miles long. There's 340 documented wrecks. The divers have found and mapped out just in the park boundaries, outside of the park boundaries even more. So, back to the slides. talk about it, but I had a slide for it. There was a uh, particularly, Anna Kappa hit the news to the point where everybody in the country knew where Anna Kappa was. Not for very long, but it's kind of like everybody in the country knew where Brentwood was a few years back. And now nobody knows where it is. Um, The, uh, the sighting incident was a big wreck. In, uh, gold was discovered in California in 18, 1848. The gold rush itself was in 1849. That's when zillions of people came pouring into the state looking for riches. 1854, so not that many years later, Actually, in those early years, if you got a sack of gold and you wanted to take it to New York and put it in the bank, a real bank, we didn't have real banks until we got the Bank of America finally in San Francisco, but if you wanted to put it in the bank, it could take you easily six months to get across the, the continent. It's bigger than you think when you're doing it on horseback and foot. Um, the other options were to sail all the way around the Horn and back up. And when you come to the museum during the day, which we'll be doing soon, I'm sure, um, we have a really nice collection of model clipper ships. The clipper ship was uh, not specifically built for the gold rush, but it turned out to be the key for a lot of people. It was kind of like the, uh, what was that jet, the Concorde? Remember the Concorde? You could pay a real premium price and get to, get to Paris in, I don't know, a couple hours less. I forget how many exactly. And uh, it, it was like that. These clipper ships could make a, well, the record passage was something like 32 days. And it stood even into the age of steam. That was a really fast way to get around. But another option that was sort of in between, that was fantastically expensive. Clipper ships would carry like 50 passengers and 150 sailors to Salem. And they were built narrow like a canoe. And they had tons of sails that had to be brought in and put out. A lot of work to sail them, but they, the secret of them was not that they were so fast, but that they could move in very light winds. They just kept going with just the nearest breeze and other ships would be calm. So, anyway, we have a nice, really nice collection of them down there. Um, this option of taking the, the the, the median option sort of was to take a uh, ship down to pa either Panama or Nicaragua. There were several companies operating out of different ports. And you would land, say, in Panama. You would take, first of all, it was walking trail and mules. Later, they built a little narrow gauge railway across where pretty much where Lake Gaetan is now, where the canal, canal route. And the one in Nicaragua was. Uh, near the southern border. Um, and you pick up a ship from the same company on the other side. Well, it sounds ideal, except getting the, the timetables together was not so easy in pre-radio days. And the ship wasn't going to sail until it got full of passengers. So you might sit there for three or four months waiting for the other <laughs> ship to come in. But the price was a lot more reasonable, so a lot of people did that. And um, when you go to Anacapa, you will be inundated with information about the great
great wreck. What was the name of the ship? <laughs> no, not any cap island. Oh, it was a question, wasn't it? <laughs> Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott. It was named the Winfield Scott. And it, it uh, December 3rd, I think it was, of uh, 1854, it, uh, the captain made it run 10 times before, no problem. But what happened was it was extremely foggy, and I won't bother putting the map back up, but he went around, he went around uh, San Miguel Island, and he thought he was just going around Anacapa. And he wound up making a turn right into Anacapa. Around midnight, everybody was in bed asleep. 400 and some passengers, women, children, men. Um, and the problem was, he grounded out in fairly shallow water. So the ship didn't sink, you know, about as deep as the deck. Nobody got injured, nobody got killed. They were able to take off lots of stores. First couple of weeks they had lobster and oysters. Life wasn't too bad. But that food started running out. And the problem was there was nothing here on the coast to go out and rescue them. There were a few fishing boats. I mean, nothing here but villages. They, no room. So basically, they, they, well, by luck, there was a ship from the same company had left, uh, had left Pan Panama and was coming up and saw them and, and rescued, could only take on board the women and children, left about 200 men out there for a couple of weeks. And this happened within a few months after the uh, coast to coast, east coast to west coast telegraph was put in place. So it hit newspapers all over the country. And everybody knew the name of... There you go. Didn't last long. So the, the uh, Department of Transportation did a study. And they sent some engineers out. They went around Anacapa. They said, lots of places Anacapa. It's got a nice high bluff. Sits 800 feet up there in the air. Put a, put a light up there and we're in good shape. They took a look at it and they said, there's no way to get on it. There's no way to get on that island. Can't get up there. So more shipwrecks, more shipwrecks. They built a, a light tower over on uh, at Port Wainini. That worked out pretty good. And they turned that into a lighthouse. Has anybody ever been over there to visit it? You can go once a month, one day a month. You can actually go on, on the base and visit that lighthouse. It's a really cool old lighthouse. The one on Anacapa, unfortunately, you can't visit because it's like everything else out there. It's so deteriorated and rusted that they're afraid to let people go up that, that light. They automated the light finally. It was built uh, originally in 1911. looked like an oil drilling rig, pretty much. And they had a shipwreck, a tanker, a pretty good-sized ship, wrecked right at the base of the light. <laughs> so we had a problem. They actually had a... a a lighthouse tender, they didn't have living quarters, so the tender would come out in a rowboat by himself. If there was wind, he'd sail. It's usually wind, but not always. So sometimes he had to row the whole way from Santa Barbara out to Anacapa. And, he, and it was an acetylene torch, and he had to light it by hand. It didn't work very well at all, actually. <laughs> so they had a lot of wrecks. So they started this one in the 20s, and they finished it in uh, 1932. And the question is, what island has a lighthouse on it that was the last full lighthouse built on the Pacific coast? <laughs> there you go. It's the news again. Yeah. That little pile of rock. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> if you dig deep enough, there's history everywhere. You have to look for it. Uh, what else can we say? Let's take a look at this one here. These are pelicans, California brown pelicans. They were, almost went extinct. They 
it almost went extinct. I don't know, maybe you've heard the story. It was uh, DDT. DDT was produced by a company later bought by Monsanto in downtown Los Angeles. And they, they dumped the effluent, they called it, or whatever the byproduct that's left over when you make DDT, they threw it in the LA River Basin. And you, you've been, you've driven across it. I mean, it wasn't cemented then, but still it was uh, no water in it, and then all of a sudden it would come washing out in a big gusher when it rained. And that piled up, actually, in uh, actual piles off the Palisades Peninsula. Well, the river empties out. The river now empties out in a different, different place down in Long Beach. Um, it was anchovies and top smelt and the little small fish would eat things like krill and other creatures that they have to dig in the mud for and so on. Small zooplankton. And it would catch in their gills, their gill feeders, as little fish. And bigger fish would come along and eat the gill feeders, and they'd get a big dose of this DDT toxin. And finally, the pelicans would eat fish that were pretty good size, who were full of DDT toxin. And it, it affected different birds in different ways. It was weird. D DDT, well, when I was a child, I also vowed not to talk about myself in this lecture, but when I was a child, they, I grew up in Minnesota, and we'd go out to the drive-in with, with my parents, and at halftime, they'd tell you to roll up their windows, and they would bring trucks and spray DDT up and down the aisles for mosquitoes. Because they, they thought, you know, the president of the company said, here, I'll drink a glass of it. And it really didn't seem to do anything to humans. And it, it didn't affect a lot of birds either, but it affected some birds in horrible ways. Bald eagles was one of them. We almost lost the bald eagle population. It's slowly been restored. And the pelicans, what happened with the pelicans is it made the eggs soft. And pelicans, when they sit on the eggs, put their big floppy feet on top of the egg and then squat down on it. So they almost went extinct. The main breeding population of brown pelicans now is on Anacapa Island. They were on the West Anacapa, they were on East Anacapa, and when the Coast Guard came out there during the war, They might have accidentally taken a pot shot at something. But anyway, the pelicans moved out and went to West Anacapa. They're slowly coming back to East Anacapa now. They're real shy nesters. They don't like to nest around humans very much. But this is one of the miraculous recoveries. And it's for the same reason. The foxes can't get the eggs. They've got this nice dry island to lay them on. The other uh, endangered bird that actually is uh, what they call endemic, meaning it, it only lives there, is a bird called, see if I can remember, they changed the name of it. It used to be, well now it's Santusa's Merlet. It used to be Scripps's Merlet, or the other way around. <laughs> I don't remember for sure. It's a really cute little bird. Um, they do counts here. It's nocturnal. So you have to go out at night if you want to see it. The chicks are hatched in uh, caves on the face of Anacapa. Anacapa has 30 or 40 caves. About 20 of them are at sea level. You can paddle into them far enough for the lights to go out. People come from around the world to kayak there. Santa Cruz also has caves. Um, but they're small caves up higher in the cliff. And these Merlets, they hatch after, they only sit the egg, I don't know, eight days or something like that. They hatch, they're with the mother being fed for about two to three days, and then the mother kicks them off. They fall off the ledge into the water, they spend the rest of their life in the water. The only time they come ashore is to breed and nest. Little tiny puffballs, the cutest little things you've ever seen, almost went extinct again for the same reasons. Now, there was an additional problem with those little guys that had to be solved. Back to the slides. And it is another claim to fame for Anacapa. The question is, what island 
in the Channel Islands National Park had its name on a book that was on the New York Times bestseller list for I forget how many weeks, several weeks. Anna Kappa. Anybody read it? It's actually a good book. It deals with the fact that when they, when the Park Service took over Anacapa and saw some of the things that were happening, they saw that these birds that nested in the cliff were being eaten by rats. Rats, rats. Black rats that would like to live on ships. They might have gotten there when the uh, shipwreck happened. They might have gotten there during the construction of the lighthouse. There's all kinds of theories about how they got there. But they didn't belong on that island. Now they're rodents so they can get... There is a deer mouse that's legally there. And they can get all their moisture from the food that they eat. They don't really need to drink any water. Rats have a little more problem, but they get along pretty well. As long as they get enough to eat. And they'll lick moisture off of leaves. and They're pretty smart. So they were going down the cliffs and they were starting to get better and better at it. And these poor cliff nesting birds were having a terrible time bringing their brood to hatch. So they, uh, the Park Service contracted with, they tried several different things, but there's a thing called the slender salamander. Mm, it's, not, it's not endangered, but it's pretty rare. It lives on Anacapa. And it likes to live in this, right alongside the trail it likes for some reason. It looks almost legless. A little tiny, tiny leg. It looks like a snake. It's like a little tiny snake. I've only seen it a few times. And they were afraid that if they sprayed regular rat poison on there, that they were going to kill all these things. That would have been horrible. So they got a, a, a kind of rat poison that uh, supposedly was safe to use around other, other animals. It would only affect rats. And the aerial sprayed it for the first time. So when was rat poison aerially sprayed for the first time on which island? <laughs> and it was in the news. PETA got, you know, PETA stands for They got involved, several other groups got involved, protesting, and, and the park superintendent said, these are rats, they're rats, they're not endangered anywhere. There's millions of them everywhere, there's surplus rats. We're trying to save an endangered animal. Anyway, the park service stood their ground. The park service has been around a long time. They've been in the Supreme Court, and they fought their fights way back. So anyway, they sprayed. and. A group got together and they read someplace that taking vitamin B, I think it was, or something like that, would counter the effects of this rat poison. So they snuck up on the island. This actually happened. It's depicted in this book. He, of course, elaborates on it and turns it into more of a fictional story. It develops personalities and all this kind of stuff that, out of the story. Because that's the basic story. And the Park Service guys caught these guys and said, what are you doing? And they told them, they said, well, just get out of here. <laughs> and it ended fairly peaceably, but that was Anna Kappa again in the news. <laughs> Let's see, what have we missed? Thinking about covers it. Twenty years ago, my wife and I we lived, in, we lived in Los Angeles. We heard the Channel Islands. We were kayakers. We said we ought to go out there. You can take a kayak and you can camp. So we came. We figured out it, on the way over here that it must have been July. And I'll tell you something: gull chicks do not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> they do not sleep. But it was a great island, and I fell in love with it, and I came back. I, uh, let me just end, because we're out of time here. I want to pay a little tribute to, could you put up Bob Riddick? I don't know if any of you knew him. Bob 
Breeding was a, he was a National Park Service volunteer when I joined the program. Uh, and he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about animals and people and how to deal with the public. And he really did teach me a lot. And he actually died in service as, <coughs> excuse me, as a volunteer. They were down at that landing cove, and they have a thing, uh, I again didn't get the pictures of this, but they do a thing called uh, Anacapo Live Dive every summer, and we put divers down in the cove with cameras, and they beam back, it was first just with the uh, Oxnard School District, but now it's on the internet, so there's classes all around the world using our curriculum, and we go down, and I've been the MC up on top a couple of times. It's really kind of fun because you don't know who you're going get to get a question from somebody and say, this is so-and-so from Indonesia. <laughs> Can we ask a question? We, we used to, the divers, I wasn't one of the divers, I'd tend to the line sometimes. They'd take like a lobster and some of the other animals that were a little harder to get and they kind of stash them away and give them some extra food to keep them around. <laughs> so when they did the shots, they'd be there. <laughs> It was sort of fun. Bob was handling the lines, and he always said, you know what, the good ranger dies with his boots on. <coughs> and uh, he was handling the lines and basically had a heart attack. He was, I mean, I feel old. He was really old. <laughs> anyway, that's pretty much all I've got to say. Let's all say it together. Anna Kappa. Epa. We didn't say what it means. What does it mean? What does it mean? Oh, I'm asking you again. What, what is the island whose name means the deceiver? Anna Kappa means the deceiver. It's a, it's called the, it was called the deceiver of the Shumash because you look out, if you live down here, you look out at any camp, but sometimes it'd be a cloud cover, it looks like it's floating. Sometimes it, if there's like real, real hot and that water's glassy, you'll get one of those inversions where it turns over like in the desert, that'll happen sometimes. That'll happen. Sometimes it disappears, it reappears. So they call it the deceiver. They did stop there. Nobody lived there, but they did make camp there where there's two middens, basically, uh, shell mounds that they found. So it was under human habitation to a certain extent, but wasn't really part of the culture of the islands. Okay, you all need to get out there. Thank you very much.